Palmer, and good to see you here tonight. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. Uh, tonight, as we begin a, um, a new series entitled uh, The Seven Blessings of Revelation, you know, I believe there's a lot of blessings that's listed in, in the Bible that God wants to pass on to you and to me, and He then wants us to be a conduit. You know, there's a difference between being a conduit and a cesspool. You know the difference? One goes in and collects, the other one collects and sends out. We are, we are supposed to, and I'll use this from, from somebody else. Um, God wants us to be a conduit, constantly flowing and being renewed. He does not want us to be a cesspool where everything comes in and just sits there and rots. Um, our life as a child of God is not to just, well, how much can we know? No, he wants to come into us and then through us. He wants us to be a conduit of him wherever we are. That's why he says, as you are going, make disciples. Not just sit and hope they're going to show up. We are supposed to be uh, doing that. There are seven blessings found in Revelation. We're going to look at the first one tonight. Excuse me just a second. Thank you, Jenny. That's good water there. And so... Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says something along this line. And God says, I never do anything without telling my priest first. Hmm, isn't that interesting? I never do anything without telling my priest, my prophets first. Now according to the scriptures, you as a child of God is called a priest and is called a prophet. You are proclaimed the word of God wherever you are. We are to be a kingdom of priests as we are going about telling the word. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that, um, that in the beginning God spoke through various ways, but in these latter days he has spoken only one way, that is through his son, Jesus Christ. And so if we're going to have a blessed life, um, uh, Kurt, I ain't got there yet, and, and stuff, and so uh, is it just moving on its own and stuff like that? Okay, yeah, it, it might just do that. If it does, just let it hit, go ahead and let it go, and it's good, and, and, and all this. So um, Revelation chapter uh, 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, read with me uh, as you follow along in a copy of God's Word that you have. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his ser servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all things that he saw. Now here's the first blessing we will find in Revelation. Blessed is he who reads and, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for moving in our lives already today in this service and the way you've moved in our earlier service this morning. And Father, we don't come wanting to have a repeat of that because you promise your mercies are fresh and new. We want you to do something new in our midst tonight. We want to understand how to live a life that is blessed by the holy God who owns everything, who's made everything, who's known everything. And Father, we submit ourselves right now to you. Father, I give myself to you fresh and new. Make me able to speak even that a three-year-old can understand tonight. And then, Father, may we just know the power of your presence. Enable me, Father. Your servant, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, what do you think about the Bible? You know, that is important. What do you think about the Bible? Uh, if I ask this question, what is the Bible? You know, if, if we went around this country or even around this, uh, this community, <clears throat> excuse me, if we were to go around this community and asking folks, what is the Bible? We would have a, a plethora, a bunch of answers upon what the Bible is Many of it is what the Bible is not because uh, people uh, come up with all kind of stuff. Uh, there, is a, there is a song that we would sing as a, that I sang as a, as a little child in vacation Bible school. The Bible is a treasure book. Da, da, da. I don't remember all the rest of the words of it, but that's true. The Bible is a treasure book. It tells the people long ago. Now, uh, let me help you out for just a moment. Those people who lived long ago that is found and enshrined, so to speak, in and the Word of God is no different than you and I. The only thing is, they are written about in the Word of God. 
God took ordinary people like you and me and he demonstrated himself not only to them but through them. Some responded, some rejected, and some was kind of whatever. And, uh, and the Bible is full. So everybody you read in here, you will find yourself in there because he takes ordinary people and he made extraordinary stories about them to show us how he deals with us with our sin, how he forgives us in our sin, and how he would expand us and grow us for his glory, not so that we can be known but that people would know about him when we study about Abraham who lived long ago it is not uh, not really so much to know about Abraham uh, at a hundred years of age and his wife Sarah at 90 having a, a child even though that is part of the story but the glory of that story is that God did that there was no way a hundred year old man and a 90 year old woman who was past childbearing in both of their years could ever have a child unless God did something there was no way in the world in, 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 in days gone by in a long time ago that, that a burning bush would just burn up and, and, and a man walks up to him and he hears these words, get your sandals off because you're on holy ground unless God did that without the bur- bush burning up. There was no way, uh, but, but it's the story of long ago, it's the story of long ago of a, of a man who rejected God's word and he was supposed to go tell somebody and he went in the total opposite direction said, I'm getting away from God, I ain't going to tell them people about nothing and he left and, and, and all of a sudden he, and then, then after, after Pete, the pagans get, get praying and, uh, and God revealed to pagans, people who didn't even believe in the God of heaven, and said, obviously you did something to anger God, what is it? And he said, listen, I've run in from God, and, and he said, take me and throw me overboard, and as they threw Jonah overboard, the sea comes down, and here comes a big fish. Only God could do that. It tells us of people long ago uh, like that. It tells us about the Savior long ago who came to down the cross for you and me that is still in effect today. He tells us about that. The Bible is a treasure book. It tells the people uh, long ago. Uh, th- there's a hymn that says, Holy Bible, book divine, precious treasure, thou art mine. It is a treasure book. It is for us to have. Second Timothy chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17, Paul writing to young Timothy, a pastor he, a pastor that he was raising up and, and, and had, had encouraged along and along. He said, all scripture is inspired or breathed out by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and to equip his people to do every good work. But you know what? I find a lot of folks in church, we almost have a superstitious attitude about the Holy Bible, about the Bible. We have a superstitious attitude about Bible reading as if we read the Bible and we can find some magic formula and sprinkle it and everything will be just fine and dandy. Listen, the Bible is not full of pixie dust. That's in Walt Disney, Peter Pan, not the Word of God Almighty. There is no magic in the Bible. There is, n- there is no mechanical reading of the Bible. If we just read this, we become this. You can't just read it. You've got to learn it. The written word of God points us to the living word who became flesh and lives among us. And it points to the one who moved into our neighborhood, as one translation says. Moved into our neighborhood to reveal to us the glorious splendor of Almighty God. The word of God, the living God, says to us, go to Jesus. The fulfillment of the written word. If we don't go to Jesus to whom this Bible points us to, we will miss the whole purpose of reading the Bible. Christians, we are not to be Bible worshipers. But we are to be doers of this word. I remember growing up, and it's nothing against my mother and father. Loved them dearly. Wonderful, godly men and women. Man and woman. But one thing I could never do, and they taught me this, you never write in the Bible. You don't put a mark in there. You don't circle this. You don't put a note in there. I was taught that way. You wouldn't know it by the, some of the Bibles I have today because I've done that. 
However, and I'm like I said, I'm not putting my mother and my father down by any means. And they were not worshipers of the Bible. But I know folks who said that same thing even today. You can't make a mark in it. You can't make a note in it. And you ask why. And they said, because you're adding things to it. No, I'm calling remembrance to what I just read. And so it's okay to make a mark in there. It, it is not okay, though, to sit there and say, well, I don't like that. Let me scratch it out. But I've known those people, too, through the years. Now, we don't worship the Bible, but we worship the Christ of the Bible. Uh, here, think, think with me for a moment. Here's a, here's a young man who is so in love with his honey that wherever he goes in his wallet, at any time he can pull it out of his pocket and flip in there, and there is the picture of his honey that he is so in love with. His heart goes like this every time he thinks about her. It goes like that every time he sees the picture, and he is so enamored with her. He is so in love with her. He carries his picture, her picture with her wherever he goes, and he pulls it out, and when he is far away from her, he will take out that picture so carefully out of his wallet, he will stare at it and with such enamored, raptured love for her that he would lean over and he would actually kiss that picture and, and declare his love uh, for her. But kissing that picture is a poor substitute of kissing the real thing. I love my wife. And I won't admit to it whether I ever did that as a young man or not. Won't, won't admit to it, but I'd much rather kiss the real thing than a picture. What you saying amen for? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Listen, same thing with the Bible. We love it because of whom it speaks of. In John chapter 5, verse 39, and Jesus confronted some of the churchgoers who read their Bible religiously and I've got to read it and I've got to read it and, 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 and they had made it such a legalistic thing every day in their lives they had to do this and he says listen you search the scriptures because they think they will give you eternal life but the scriptures point to me because they said hey if I just read the Bible I'll get in one day and he says no just because you read the Bible you can still bust hell wide open you read the Bible that points to me and to have a living relationship with me that's what the Bible tells Teaches. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. And when we get into the New Testament, it reveals Jesus. And then in Acts, it tells us how to live for Jesus. And that's how we are to be about. The authority of the Holy Scriptures for which it ought to believe and obey depends not upon the testimony of any man or any church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. And therefore, it is to be received because it is the Word of God. Somebody said that. Let me read that to you again. The authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed depends not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. And therefore it is to be received because it is the word of God. And so the question is, if we are going to receive this blessing in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. If we are going to have this blessed life, how are we to live it? How are we to receive it? And what are we to do about it? Well, let's look at this for just one moment. Again, this is blessing number one out of seven blessings that we're going to look at over the next several weeks. And let's see the seven blessings, how they're going to bless us and how they would aid us in living for God and living a blessed life that, that glorifies and honors God. Notice what he says. He says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. The first blessing that you and I see right here is... It's the blessedness of those reading, hearing, and keeping the prophecy. There is an emphasis on the importance of the Word of God. It is an importance on the Word of God. Uh, you might say, well, what's that word blessed mean? That word blessed, and you have an outline in your, in your bulletin, and, and it might be up on the screen and stuff there. But anyway, that word blessed means having divine favor bestowed upon you. 
having the divine favor of God bestowed upon you. Notice what it says. The divine favor of Almighty God is, the, is bestowed upon those who read the words of this prophecy, who hear the words of this prophecy, and who keeps those things which are written in it. And so we need to be mindful that God is wanting to bestow his divine favor upon you. He wants to pour it out upon you and to bless your life tremendously. And here is the first blessing on how we are to live a God-blessed life. The divine favor being bestowed upon us, being poured out upon us in the fullness because we read, because we hear, and because we keep. Notice he also says, bless, meaning the divine favor is upon us. To whom first? To those, to the person who reads. That means one who reads aloud in public, such as in a church service. Now, years ago, because the Bible was only written in certain languages, uh, and, and it was translated into Latin for some churches, but it was written in Greek, in the New Testament, Hebrew and Aramaic in the Old Testament. And there was times because most people did not have an education enough to be able to read. And so therefore, uh, only the person that could read it publicly a lot of times was somebody who had an education, the pastor, the priest, or, or uh, somebody else who had uh, enough resources to get an education. And, uh, and, and so they would stand and read. And so that person would, uh, that person would receive a, a special blessing because they read it publicly, but, uh, but, but it's also one who reads it aloud even to themselves and it is being read publicly. That's one reason it is important for you to bring this with you when you walk through them doors. It amazes me how many Christians never come to church with a Bible. It amazes me. Listen, you say, well, can, you being legalistic? Well, I don't think so. How are we to learn? If you went to, went to a learning place at your work or school, you would be expected to carry your Bible. Is it such a, star, a, 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 a stretch of the imagination to believe that we come here, whether it's Sunday school or discipleship time or worship service time or any other time that we gather together, that we should have this with us? It is our textbook. Now, you say, well, how can you bring it? You can bring it that way. Listen, on my smartphone, like many of you, I've got it on my Bible. I've got a Bible on my phone. I'm okay with that. I'm okay even if you bring it on an iPad. I'm okay with that. But don't be sitting there cruising the Internet. Well, let me, let me see what's happening over on my Facebook page. No, you, you, you done gone wrong. There are those that, that will bring it, and, 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 and I, we had this at, at, at my former church. We had some folks that they brought their, uh, they brought their electronic Bible, and when, when, when they would read it, and then after I get finished reading the Scripture, uh, they was on Facebook, they were on their personal calendar, they were doing their work. What are you doing? Well, can't you do two things at one time? Yeah, but there's a time we ought to be concentrating on the Word of God, too. Not that I had to be the most important person at the time, but... Uh, somewhere's in the line. When you, when you concentrate and reading everything on Facebook and responding to that, you, you, you might be hearing, but you ain't getting it. Okay. I, I'm going to leave that one alone for right now. Okay. But it's important for us to bring our Bible to church because then we can read it. You said weeks translation. There are good translations out there. Bring the one that opens up the Word to you. Okay. I, I might got in trouble with somebody on that one, but anyway. I'm going to leave that with you and God, okay? Okay, and so divine favor is bestowed upon the person who reads that word aloud in public, and it says, the, reads the words of this prophecy. That is a message who's given by a prophet, the one who proclaims the word of God. Thus says God's word. That's, that's who that is. The one who, who opens up the words of God so we can understand. So, so uh, remember we, we read uh, out, of, out of Timothy just a moment ago about uh, the word of God is given by God to teach us and what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our life. That's what a prophet does. It, he, he proclaims that. He proclaims uh, when we are wrong and it teaches us what to do with, uh, to, 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 to do what is right. Because God will take that word that's proclaimed to us to prepare us and to equip us so that we can do every good work that he's assigned for us to do. It is, a, it is the appearance of prophetic activity. It's the minister of the gift of prophecy. The person who proclaims that word and helps us to understand that word. 
Second Peter, um, uh, Peter writes these words, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or if you're a human, from a human initiative. No, these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. This is not man's idea. It is God's word to you and to me. He says, God will pour out his divine favor upon those who are reading the words of this prophecy, who are hearing, who listens with understanding and accepts the word and learns to obey its teaching by taking it to heart, meaning they ponder upon it and they guard it in order to fulfill it. When you hear the word of God, do you dismiss it or do you guard it in order to do it? There's a world of difference. Listen, I don't want to ever stand and preach my sermon. But I do want to stand and proclaim God's word and God's message. It should never be my sermon. But thank you, Lord, for the sermon that you've given, who corrected us, who challenged us, and who, which applies to us. James says, don't just look in the Word, or just don't hear the Word, but put it into practice. Don't be like the person who, who looks in the mirror and forgets what he looks like. But a lot of times we do that. Stories told of a little girl who read her Bible often. And she came home one day to her mother and said, Mama, let me show you some fruit that somebody gave me. And her mother said, Oh, that's great. I'm sure a friend's giving you. And she said, But Mama, this isn't all of it. Well, what did you do? Did you eat some? No, I gave some away. Well, who did you give it to, Susie? And Susie said, Well, there's a little girl. You know, I keep telling about a Gertrude. She's always mean to me. Every time I go, she hits me. She pulls my hair. She kicks me. She pushes me down. She knocks my books out of my hand. And so I gave her some of the fruit that I have because the Bible said to be good to those who treat you bad. If a little eight-year-old girl can get that, we at 80 should. See, the Bible is full of history, but it's not a history book. The Bible is full of science, but it is not a science book. The Bible is a good novel, but it is not a novel book. The Bible even answers deep spiritual questions, but that's not the purpose of the Bible. The Bible is the most important book that we could ever read that was written with the greatest of love so that the most common man, you and me, can find meaning beyond our imagined limits. Psalm 119, the psalmist wrote, Thy word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. Leading us where we don't even know and think we can go. But with the word lighting our way, there it goes. So let me give you three keys to, to the God-blessed life. The first one, and, and all three of these are active words. Blessed is he who reads. So we, you got to read the word. It is a written record of God's interaction with us. It is, it, the, the Bible is not God. It is a written record of God's word on how to be saved and how to live saved. That's what it tells us about. How to be saved, how to live in relationship with God, how to leave our sin behind, and how to confess that, how to repent of it, and come to Almighty God who says, if you will confess your sin, I will be faithful and just to forgive your sin and to free you from it all. That's what it's about. It tells us how to be saved and how to live saved. Uh, the, the, the word that we read just a moment ago in the Greek says, read the word. It means to read it publicly without being ashamed of what we read. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, he says, I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. We who are not Jewish of nature, uh, we are Gentiles. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. And as the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. 
And so if you want to live a God-blessed life, the first thing, you must read the Word. The second thing you must do, he says there, if you want to have God's favor poured out upon you, not only must you read the words, but you must hear the word. So hear the word. Listen with understanding. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes from what? From hearing and hearing from the good news about Jesus Christ, from the word of God. Listen, we can do all kind of things in church. We can do this and we can do that. We can do all kind of stuff in worship services that we call attention and praising God. But the scripture says that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the good news about Jesus, from the word of God. Listen, as you hear, you are to process it, you are to think about it, you are to encapsulate it, meaning to, to, to take away from it and say, how do I apply this to my life today? As you ponder it, you get it down inside of you, you let it take root. Why? So that you can be all that God wants to do. So it gets down in there and because what's on the inside is going to come on the outside. That's one reason you ought to read your Bible every day. You say, how much do I read every day? That's up to you and God. Even if you read one verse, or sometimes, you know, sometimes in my own daily quiet time, and, and I have a plan program, so to speak, that I use in my own daily quiet time every day of reading the Bible, there are some days I only read a half a sentence. And God takes that as I ponder on it and encapsulate it, and he grows that. Other days I read two or three or four chapters. Other days I read more than that, less than that. Listen, Why? What is God wanting to say? Because as I read, here's the thought that I have. God, and I've taught my children this same thing. God, what are you saying there, and how does it apply to my life today? That's how you and I ought to read the Word. God, what are you saying, and how does it apply to my life today? That's one reason you ought to take notes during sermons. Whether you have an outline in the bulletin or not, you ought to bring a notebook with you, a notepad, and take notes. Why? Because when you get home, you can go back over. You can go back and look at it. In fact, Paul uh, told, the, uh, told, told, told a group of folks, the Bereans, he said, I am so glad that you take the word that I preach to you and you go back home and you study that word to make sure I am true with the word. I'm glad that we've got folks here that takes, takes notes. But take a note. Bring your pen. Bring your paper. Why? Because you because there's going to be something you're going man. I want to remember that. And by the time you by the time you uh, breathe your last uh, breath in here for us to get out of here, uh, you don't forgot it. But if you got it written down, sometimes you know. Sometimes whenever I'm I'm, I'm at, at preaching or sometimes even with guest speaker here, sometimes and, and 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 I do Twitter. And there are times that that um, somebody will say something, or a song will say something, or or or, or, or a preacher will say something. I, I, won't put, I won't remember that. I'll write it down, but I'll tweet it out real quick because I want somebody out there who's not going to church that's on my Twitter or my Facebook. I want them to get that because I, I, I've ministered to people that way. You know, it's okay. It's okay, but don't let that be your reason. Because, well, let me see what I can send out right now. But it's okay to do that. But read. Read the Bible. Take notes to a sermon. But notice what else he says. He said, read the Word. Hear the Word. And that's where most of us stop. He said to obey the word. That's the third thing. He says obey the word. Take it to heart. Guard it as if your very life depended on you keeping it. What good is it? Listen, my friends. What good is it if it, we just hear it but we don't live it? 1 John chapter 2 verse 6 says, Those who say they live in God shall live their lives as Jesus did. And where do we find where, what Jesus did? Right here in this holy word. That's why it's important every day. God, let me read as I read this. How does this apply to my life today? Because I want to reflect Jesus. How did this? How does this impact my life today? And you might be saying, "Well, what's the big deal about reading and hearing and keeping?" He says four, and that word four right there says, "Let me tell you why I'm telling you this." There's a reason behind. Why God's saying, I want to put my divine favor on you for reading it and hearing it and obeying it. And so why, why did he say, I want you to do that? Why, why do I want to bless you this way? Why did God want you to live this way? He says, for something. Notice what it says at the end of chapter 1, verse 3. The time is near. The time is near. In the Greek word, that word time is is kairos. Kairos. 
It means the appointed season of your life. Listen, you've got seasons in your life. You've got good times in your life, good seasons in your life. You've got difficult seasons in your life. You've got fruitful seasons in your life. You've got favorable seasons in your life. You've got seasons of crisis in your life. And on and on we go. We've got seasons in our lives. And God wants to bless you in every season. And the only way you can get blessed in every season is by reading the Word, hearing the Word, and keeping the Word through every season. The Word of God is good for every season of your life, just not the stand up and shout and dance hallelujah but notice he says the time is near the seasons of your life are near that word near means will soon be completed because see one day as hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says it is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment there is a season in your life that you will die and go from this life into eternity and that time is near you said, when? I'm only so-and-so age. You don't know when your season of death is going to come, but it is going to come. And he says it is near, it is at hand, because, see, time as we measure it does, is not the way God measures it. A thousand days is just like one day to God, and one day is just like a thousand days to God. Time measurement does not matter. So our time is going to be near. And so he wants, us, he wants to bless us in every season of our life because our time will, is near, will soon be completed. This is all the more urgent. Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 13, verse 11, this is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. That's why it's important as Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 4 says that as we've gone through seasons in our lives and God has ministered to us in those seasons in our life that we are to minister to others going through similar seasons in their lives. We are to pass it on because time is near. Let me ask you this one question as we end tonight. You are wanting the divine favor, the blessing of God upon your life. You are to hear it, you are to read it, and you are to obey it. What is one action you can do this week that says, I will seek this blessing in my life? What would you seek? How would you seek this blessing in your life? The blessing of the eternal word of God. What the importance of God's word. What will you do this week? to seek the blessing of God in your life. Will you commit that to him tonight? And then when you leave here in a little bit, go out and live that way, seeking that blessing. Pray with me. Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus, knowing that your word is a living, powerful word. It was not given to us just for whatever reason, just for you to have something to do, nor for us just to have something to do, 